Everyone wants to talk about neural networks, machine learning, data science topics. Nobody wants to do basic, basic statistics, basic exploratory data analysis. And I understand where most of these folks are coming from. Really, I, I do. And, you know, nobody wants to do data cleaning, pre-processing. We want to get to the fun stuff, right? Predicting stock returns, analyzing signals, optimizing signals, building systems to deploy our signals. But at the end of the day, it really all does come down to to basic statistics as to whether or not your trading strategy is going to be effective in a live situation. In this video, what I want to do is I want to introduce the idea of a neural network as a complicated model. Complicated, I, I say loosely, of course, and it's really a model that's going to be able to learn a relationship between a set of inputs and a set of outputs. But it is one of many models we could select. A neural network is, you know, something that is very popular these days, as you know, we see in large language models, neural networks are deployed quite aggressively. But coming from traditional statistics, we have basic machine learning models like a, a linear regression that we can also use. What I want to do is I want to pin these models against each other. And I want to see the results in a very simple setting of trying to use yesterday's return to predict today's return. Okay, we're going to be looking at the S&P 500. We're going to be learning from a set of data. And then we are going to be testing on a different set of data. We're going to do time series train test splits for those of you who are concerned. But we'll get there when we get there. We're going to start by looking at our data. I'm going to simply plot a histogram of our returns and I'm going to look at a scatter plot of yesterday's return relative to today's return. So let's get started. I'm going to start by visualizing the distribution of S&P 500 returns and you'll see it's centered about zero. That's something that we would expect. Perhaps we have some spikes out to the side, some, some outliers, but more or less it's going to be centered about zero. It's going to exhibit some excess kurtosis. It's a stylized fact of the market um, among a whole set of stylized facts that we can expect to see when we visualize empirical returns. And what I'm also going to do is take a look at a scatter plot of yesterday's return relative to today's return for returns going back five years. And what you're going to see is you're going to see this sort of just ball of points. All right. Now, why, why is this important? This is like some of the most basic statistics that you can do. If I was to condition on yesterday's return being, let's say zero, what can I expect today's return to be? Remember, so yesterday's return was zero. What can I expect today's return to be? Well, I'm drawing a vertical line at zero. That's what the conditional expectation is essentially doing. And it's looking at all of the points that are around zero and saying, hey, what do we tend to expect? What do we tend to expect to have happen in the S&P 500 returns given yesterday was in fact zero? Well, if you look at these points, they're not all above zero. They're not all below zero. They're just pretty evenly distributed in a cluster about zero. And yeah, sure, you have some points that are, you know, outside or, or well below. But what this is saying in a very basic visualization is there is nothing that tends to happen it is simply going to be random. And this is this makes sense, right? And the reason why this makes sense is because if we only look at yesterday's price and then we look at today's price, that is yesterday's return and today's return, do we have sufficient information to really be able to predict the return? Abso absolutely not, right? All we have is pricing information and whether or not return increased or decreased relative to the previous day. That is what is being plotted here on the X and Y axis. But we know nothing of the macro environment. What happened to interest rates? What happened to inflation? Where, was there any news? We didn't do any natural language processing. We didn't do any image recognition. We didn't do any video recognition. We didn't do anything in a quantitative capacity to try to analyze signal. All we're doing is looking at yesterday's return relative to today's return. There's nowhere near sufficient information to predict that sort of chaos. Clearly, there's nowhere near. And, you know, this isn't conjecture. Just look at this ball of points. If I said, okay, you know, yesterday's return was, was 0.25. Tomorrow's return could be anything from point, 0.025 
to negative 0.025 and maybe there's even an outlier that's not being displayed here because I've limited the uh, the range of the x and y axes here so the point of looking at these these basic basic data visualizations is given that we just are looking at pricing information in this context clearly there's no relationship to learn between the input being the previous day's return and the output being today's return and if there was even some correlation we would see it in this visualization right so there would be some sort of set of scatter points that are, are going up into the right or down into the right or you know however you would like to, to classify the correlation as a strong moderate weak linear correlation there's nothing of the sort in this setting so the whole purpose of, of this initial data visualization is to suggest before we get into the modeling and we look at the linear regression and the neural network, we don't have any sufficient information to predict returns. If we could predict market returns based on yesterday's return, I would be, you know, in Greece right now on my yacht. I would not be here talking about this, this scatter plot of, of lagged returns, okay? That is exactly my point. We have insufficient information to predict the future return based on the previous return. So when we actually go about developing these models, what can we expect to have happen? Well, clearly I'm not going to learn anything or my model's not going to learn anything and it's not going to be predictive out of sample in any capacity. That's to say I could have the greatest neural network structure in existence. And if I take those lagged returns and I throw them into my neural network, then the prediction that it's going to create for returns, say, tomorrow, are going to be quite poor. And that's because we don't have sufficient information to actually model that problem. Now, whether I have the coolest neural network in the world or I'm just using a basic linear regression, both models are going to fail in a similar capacity, even if they're you know, pre-processed correctly, if you will, and the training and testing splits are correct the model is not going to be robust out of sample and that's because there is no trend to extract i don't need to show you more than one picture to realize that there is no relationship between the previous day's return and today's return that is just observed visually by this chart if there was a relationship we would see it graphically here now of course as you add more information there may be a general relationship that emerges you know it wouldn't be crazy to suggest that as interest rates are cut or maybe inflation beats expectations we see some sort of you know relationship between return and and that outcome you know if inflation was to go down and you know everybody thought it was going to increase then maybe return is going to go up you know that could be a contemporaneous response but remember we're looking here in a lagged capacity right this is predictive we're not looking at contemporaneous variables. We're looking at something that is purely predictive. And in this case, there is no correlation. So regardless of the model that we select, we expect it to perform quite poorly. So let's walk through the modeling process for a neural network. It's really the same as, as a linear regression. And then talk about the results of the linear regression relative to the neural network and talk about how it all comes down to information. What we'll do here is break up our data into a training set and a testing set. If you've seen a train test split before, this is nothing new to you. If you've never heard of this idea, then simply all we're doing is we're taking the data that we have and we're breaking it up into two sets. One set that our model is going to try to learn from and another set that our model is going to test itself on. And the reason we want to do this is because we don't want to overfit our data. When we learn from data we're going to go out and we are going to test that model on data it's never seen before so why don't we just mimic this when we actually go about developing our model that's why we do the train and test split to see how robust our model is out of sample now of course we're dealing with chronological data so we can't randomly shuffle samples in this data we are going to do a time series train test split and that's exactly what i have here so I'm going to break this up into four tensors. I'm going to have the input tensor and I'm going to have the output tensors in the training and testing capacities. Since now we have the training and testing data split up, we can go about developing our models. Developing models is quite simple once you've done all of the hard work 
pre-processing and cleaning your data and separating it into training and testing splits, maybe even a validation split, depending on what you're trying to do. But here, what I have is a simple linear regression. I am going to fit the linear regression. That is, I'm telling the line of best fit, the linear regression to learn from the training data. I'm going to compute the overall error of that training data. And then I'm going to compute the error of that model when I test it on the testing data. So if I look at the mean squared error of the training data, I get 0.99. If this model was robust and the splits were reasonable, then I can expect similar performance out of sample. But my model is not robust. There's no information to glean. Remember, I'm just overfitting noise when I learn from this training set. And if you need further convincing, just look at this mean squared error of the testing set. That is, I have a 33.50 mean squared error of the testing set. So this linear regression model is learning nothing from the training set. And doesn't that make sense? There's nothing to learn. If I look at this blob of data, there's no correlation between the lagged return and the future return. In fact, it would be quite concerning if, if it did learn something. And we would have to figure out what is going on with our model and why it's behaving in that way, because there is nothing to learn here. And we, we can see this time and time again by just shuffling the split of our data, learning from the training set, and then testing on the testing set. We're always going to get a reasonable mean squared error in the training set. That is, we're overfitting to the noise in our training set. And then we're not learning from the data. So when we go about testing on our testing set, we do extremely poorly at 33.50 is extremely large relative to the 0.999. Okay, and, and this is clearly an example of overfitting, but I want to connect this idea of overfitting to sufficient information for predicting the response variable that we are trying to model. And that is, we don't have any information about things that could be relevant to the return on it on a given day even in a lagged setting, what if I took all of the news articles from yesterday and I threw it into the model? Wouldn't that be arbitrarily better? Maybe. What if I took all the macro variables from yesterday? Do you, we're, we're missing so much relevant information that explains variation in our response variable, that is the return for tomorrow, that if our model actually learned something simply from the lagged price, uh, that would be just absolutely absurd. And it, there's probably more of an issue in your, your model construction or your interpretation of the response than, than anything else. All right, now we have our neural network. This is the exact same thing, all right? Instead of just using a line of best fit, I'm gonna use a neural network to try to learn from the previous return, that is the lagged return for the relative future day, the future day's return. And all I'm gonna do is I'm gonna say, hey, use the training set of data, learn the relationship between the input, the previous day's return and the output, today's return, and see if you can come up with some sort of relationship and then test it out of sample on our testing set, see how you do. It's the exact same problem. Instead of using a line of best fit, we're gonna use a neural network. And if you scroll on down here, you know we can see that the mean squared error for the neural network is 0.95. Too. This might suggest that it actually overfits the noise better than the line of best fit. And that very well may be the case. But in fact, it performs worse out of sample. We have 33.75 as the mean squared error on the testing set. So when we take our model, whether it be the linear regression or the neural network, we fit it to the training data and we test it out of sample to see how robust the model is in both settings they perform extremely poorly and this literally folks comes down to basic basic statistics and exploratory data analysis understanding what you have as information to predict a response variable all going back to this idea of this noisy blob of points that we visualized earlier so when we compare the results, we can see, okay, you know, the linear regression generates a, a reasonable in sample MSE and so does the neural network and then out of sample has a, an egregious error. And, you know, you can even kind of see anecdotally that, yeah, the neural network does overfit the noise better um, and it does, you know, perform worse out of sample.
and it performs worse than a, a robust sense. And that's because neural networks can overfit your data and noise very, very easily. So you have to figure out when you're going to stop training them. Typically you use some sort of, you know, train test validation split, and then you'll, you'll have some sort of arbitrary cutoff as the validation error begins to, to increase. But that's a, a video for another day on optimizing performance. The whole point of this video is to discuss the model that is a neural network in the context of prediction with insufficient information. And that's what we've seen here. We've seen, okay, if I just look at a data set of returns, whether it be for market returns, some sort of you know, ETF, whatever, whether it be for a specific equity, we do not have sufficient information in a predictive capacity. And you don't need to throw the kitchen sink at it. I could use the most basic linear regression, which has an analytical solution for the mean squared error. We can just optimize it analytically and then get our optimal coefficients and use it right away. Out of sample, it performs very poorly. I could do stochastic gradient descent and fit my neural network to the training data and have it get a even smaller in sample MSC to the neural network, or I'm sorry, to the linear regression. But as you can see, you you don't have robust out of sample performance. So my point in this video is to suggest that in the context of, of modeling returns, and this is something I feel is overlooked, especially when you start to learn about data analytics and, and basic statistics for data science, machine learning, neural networks is, you know, no matter, no model, no matter how complicated it is, is going to generate predictive power from, from nothing. You need relevant information for the item that you're trying to predict. This is where the economic interpretation becomes extremely useful. Nobody wants to do that part because that's, that's the part that's work. That's the part that is, that makes you a, a researcher, a quantitative researcher, a a PhD student is you're going out, you're collecting relevant data, maybe data that nobody else thought could be relevant, right? Maybe you're looking at CEO expressions in interviews and that is something that, sh that is relevant in the cross section and has some sort of capacity to explain variation in data. That is where all of the work is done. And that's where unique predictors are found and implemented. And that's how quant strategies are developed you're not going to generate predictive power from nothing using the same factors that everybody else has been using for, for all time. There's no way that your Bollinger Bands have predictive power. There, there's no way. So I hope this video was informative. I hope this sort of started to shed some, some, some light on the idea of how we go about modeling in a quantitative capacity relative to the response variable that we're looking to predict. Um, also relative to the context of model complexity, how, you know, just because we increase model complexity, it doesn't necessarily mean we're going to get better results. That is not necessarily to say that it isn't worthwhile to increase model complexity, because suppose we have a, a large number of, of variables in our data set that we're aiming to use to predict some sort of response variable like future returns we may need more complicated models to identify the relationships that we desire to aid in the prediction of that response variable. So a linear regression might not be effective if we don't know the relevant transformations of the data that are required to identify those relationships. But that will be a video for another day. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed and I will see you in the next video.